Now, I want to talk, first of all, about what are called the criteria of authenticity. This is absolutely crucial because in order to establish what is uh, historically provable about Jesus of Nazareth, you need to have certain criteria that will tell you what uh, uh, can be established historically about Jesus. These criteria are crucial in historical study, and therefore it's vitally important to state the criteria accurately and precisely. If you don't get the criteria right, the conclusions you draw are going to be wrong. And therefore, it's very important to state the criteria accurately and precisely. And I must say, I was very surprised when I read Dr. Ehrman's writings on the historical Jesus and found the sloppiness with which he states and applies these criteria. In every single case, Dr. Ehrman misformulates the criterion and then he goes on to misapply it. And there is example after example after example of this which I will give. And this is a consistent pattern in the way Bart Ehrman deals with the historical Jesus. First, he misstates the criterion, then he misapplies it. Now, this is important because when I formulate my case for the resurrection of Jesus, I do so with these criteria deliberately in mind. When I give those four facts on which the inference to the resurrection of Jesus is based, namely the honorable burial of Jesus in the tomb, the discovery of his empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection, all uh, and every one of these four facts is established by the very criteria that Bart Ehrman states and endorses. And so even using his own criteria, there's no basis for being skeptical about these fundamental facts with respect to Jesus' resurrection. Now let's look in more detail at the criteria of authenticity as Bart Ehrman states them. The first criterion is independent attestation. Do we have that? Okay, here is how he states the criterion of independent attestation. Quote, an event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historically accurate than an event mentioned in only one. <clears throat> and this comes from his lectures on the historical Jesus with the teaching company. That's what TC stands for with the page number in his teaching company uh, lectures on the historical Jesus. Now what's the problem with this formulation of the criterion of independent attestation? Well notice that it makes the criterion a comparative measure between two different events. It says an event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historically accurate than some other event mentioned in only one. Now, as such, by making it a comparison between two different events, it's obviously false, because the singly attested event could pass other criteria which make it as likely or even more likely than the multiply attested event. The event which is found in only one source might pass other criteria, like the criterion of embarrassment or the criterion of dissimilarity, and then be highly historically probable, even though it's only singly attested rather than multiply attested. So Ehrman has simply misformulated the criterion of independent attestation. Here's the correct formulation. An event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historical than it would have been had it been mentioned in only one. An event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historical than it would have been had it been mentioned in only one. Or more simply, independent attestation increases the probability that an event is historical. So if an event in the life of Jesus is attested in 
independent sources, then it's more probable that that's historical because it's unlikely to have been independently made up by two different sources. This is one of the most important criteria that historians use in assessing historicity of events, whether it's independently attested. Second criterion is the criterion of dissimilarity. Here's how Ehrman states the criterion. Any tradition about Jesus that does not coincide with or that works against the vested interests of the Christians who preserved it is likely to be historically reliable. Any tradition about Jesus that does not coincide with or works against the vested interests of the Christians who preserved it is likely to be historically reliable. Well, what's the problem with this statement of the criterion of dissimilarity? Well, twofold. Number one, it conflates and distorts two distinct criteria, namely the criterion of dissimilarity and the criterion of embarrassment. It conflates these two and distorts them. Here's what the correct statement of the criterion of dissimilarity should uh, be. If a tradition about Jesus is different from the Judaism that preceded him and the Christian movement which came after him, then it's likely to be historically reliable. If a tradition about Jesus is different from the Judaism that preceded him and the Christian movement that followed him, then it's likely to be historically reliable. And the idea there is that if it's not from antecedent Judaism, then likely it, it didn't come from there. If it's unlike the later Christian church, then it was unlikely to have been made up by them, so it probably originated with the historical Jesus himself. That's the criterion of dissimilarity. Here's the criterion of embarrassment. If a tradition about Jesus is embarrassing or awkward for the early Christian movement, then it's likely to be historically reliable. If a tradition about Jesus is embarrassing or awkward for the early Christian movement, then it's likely to be historically reliable because it's unlikely the early Christian movement would make up or invent stories about Jesus that would be awkward or embarrassing for the Christian faith. Now, Ehrman's statement not only blurs these two criteria together, but notice that it leaves wholly out of account Jesus' distinctiveness from Judaism. He fails to mention uh, that if something is dissimilar from antecedent Judaism, that increases its historical probability. Now, Ehrman, uh, that, that's the first problem, is that it conflates and distorts these two separate criteria. Here's the second problem with his statement of the criterion of dissimilarity. He consistently confuses this criterion with the problem of bias in one's sources, and that's just not the same thing dissimilarity and embarrassment are positive criteria for establishing historicity. If something is dissimilar or embarrassing, that's a positive argument in favor of historicity. But Ehrman uses them negatively to undermine historical <coughs> credibility. And this negative use of the criteria is widely recognized as fallacious because it would yield a Jesus who had absolutely no impact on the movement which followed him and who was utterly unlike antecedent Judaism which preceded him. So it would give you a, a bizarre Jesus, a Jesus who was utterly unlike Judaism and who had no impact on the Christianity which followed him. So a negative use of the criteria is Ill, illegitimate. They can only be used to establish positively historical traditions about Jesus, not to call into question historical traditions about Jesus. In other words, if something is not dissimilar or not embarrassing, that's not a proof that it's unhistorical. If something is dissimilar or embarrassing, that counts in favor of historicity. That's the positive use of the criteria. But if something is not dissimilar or not embarrassing, that's no proof that it's not historical. Criterion number three, contextual credibility. Here he says, any tradition about Jesus that cannot be 
plausibly situated in first century Palestinian context cannot be accepted as historically reliable. Any tradition about Jesus that cannot be plausibly situated in first century Palestinian context cannot be accepted as historically reliable. Well, now that's just a truism. Uh, and the problem with that truism is that it's purely negative, and so it doesn't establish what is uh, historical about Jesus. It would just exclude something that would be unhistorical, but it doesn't establish anything positively about Jesus. The correct formulation of the criterion of contextual credibility would be traditions about Jesus which cohere well with already established facts about Jesus have a good probability of being historically reliable. Traditions about Jesus which cohere well with already established facts about Jesus have a good <clears throat> probability of being historically reliable. So correctly understood then, we have four criteria for establishing traditions about Jesus. Independent, attestation, dissimilarity, embarrassment, and contextual credibility. Now let me show next Bart Ehrman's misuse of the criteria of authenticity. First, he re his use of the criteria results in a distortion of the historical Jesus. A real historical person is a much richer reality than what can be proved about a person. Think of Napoleon, for example. The historical Napoleon is a much, much richer figure than what we can prove about Napoleon, right? What you can prove about Napoleon is a small subset of the man who actually lived. We, we don't know a lot of things about his private life or what he was doing that wasn't recorded by historians. But Ehrman equates, quote, a strictly historical perspective with what we can show on historical grounds. He equates the historical Jesus with, with what you can prove about Jesus. And that leads to a reconstructed Jesus, which is a pale abstraction of the robust reality that actually lived. The historical Jesus who actually lived is a much richer reality than what we can prove about Jesus. They're not the same thing. Now, the next major point I want to make is that the criteria, when properly used, show the reliability of traditions about Jesus, but Ehrman tries to use them negatively to show unreliability. He misuses the criteria. The criteria can be properly used only to establish positively historical elements about Jesus, but Ehrman uses them negatively to try to show unreliability. For example, he says, and I quote, some of the best known traditions of Jesus' birth cannot be accepted as historically reliable when gauged by our criteria. Some of the best known traditions of Jesus' birth cannot be accepted as historically reliable when gauged by our criteria. Notice that's a negative use of the criteria. But the criteria can't be used negatively to establish non-historicity. They can only be used positively to establish historicity. So it's, it's impossible when they're used properly to say that these birth narratives are shown to be unhistorical in, in nature. What he should say is that some of the best known traditions of Jesus' birth cannot be positively proven to be historical by these criteria. And that's unobjectionable. Uh, there can be lots of things about Jesus that we cannot prove using these criteria that are nevertheless recorded in the gospel. So you see how he slides from saying these birth traditions cannot be proven to be historical to the, by the criterion to saying that therefore they cannot be accepted as historically reliable uh, on the basis of these criteria. Or here's another example. We don't have any reliable information concerning what Mary actually thought of Jesus because the traditions are not multiply attested and don't pass the criterion of dissimilarity. See the negative use of the criteria there? Because 
They're not multiply attested because they're not dissimilar. Therefore, he says, none of this information is reliable that we have in the Gospels. You can't use the criteria negatively in that way. At best, the criteria...